Come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart. Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Jennifer Innes. I'm the minister with this congregation in all the ways that we serve together as a beloved community of all ages and at all stages of life. We live into our calling to be more just, more loving, more welcoming. And as we reflect on our theme uh, for this month, Widening the Circle, Uh, We reflect on all the circles of our relationships in this life, and I include the name of the Peoria people. This is their ancestral home. They greeted the first European settlers and aided them, and we offer our humble respect for the Peoria people's history and for their ongoing life. We also, in our circles of care, we also practice being good stewards of this congregation, The beloved community is sustained by the time and skill and financial support of its members and friends. The offering plates are by the door as you enter and leave the sanctuary. Please leave a financial gift on the way out. And of course, donations are accepted online and through the mail. Please see the link that is available. The stories that we tell, the the community that we honor and cherish and and take good care of in all the ways that we can. These include stories of abundance and generosity, of simple care one to another. And we all get to be part of those efforts. And you can be part of the living legacy that we share by making an offering today. So thank you. And now... I want to let us continue with worship as we turn to our first hymn, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning. You are welcome to rise in body or spirit and join me in feeling the hymn, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning.
sorry. This is the congregation that gathers in faith, not faith in one religion or one God or any one way. We gather in faith of the power of diversity, the power of love, and the hope of a world transformed by our care. We gather in faith in ourselves and those around us. Not a faith that requires perfection or righteousness in one another. Rather, a faith that in our shared imperfection, we may learn to stumble and fall together. Faith that we will help one another to rise and to try again and again. We are Unitarian Universalists. I'd like to invite Amanda Franklin and family up for the chalice lighting. Out of the Flames by the Reverend Sarah Eileen Lawal. Out of the flames of fear, we rise with courage of our deepest convictions to stand for justice, inclusion, and peace. Out of the flames of scrutiny, we rise to proclaim our faith with hope to heal a fractured and hurting world. Out of the flames of doubt, we rise to embrace the mystery, wonder, and awe of all there is and all that is yet to be. Out of the flames of hate, we rise with the force of love, love that celebrates our shared humanity. Out of the flames, we rise. And now let us enter into our interlude gathered here in the mystery of the hour. morning. Today, as we're talking about tolerance in our relationships in the world, it feels right to share a story about a very important hero for tolerance from our UU history, a man named John Sigismund. Long ago, far across the sea in Poland, there lived a king and a queen named Sigismund and Bona. They had a daughter named Isabella. As Isabella grew, they taught her to be a good and wise ruler over all the people of the land. When Princess Isabella was grown, a king from a neighboring country asked to marry her, and her parents said yes. Isabella was excited to be marrying King John of Hungary, even though she realized she'd have to leave home. 
She and her parents shared a tearful goodbye, and then with her parents' blessing, Isabella set out with a hopeful heart, determined to be a good wife to her new husband and a wise queen for her land. Isabella wanted to be a good queen and to help all of the people, but the land of Hungary was torn by great wars. The king fought with other kings. The kings and the people fought about religion and land. They fought and fought and fought, and many people died. Isabella's husband was even away fighting when their baby was born. She wrote him to please come home and see their son, but King John became sick and died before he could even see his child. The wars didn't stop when the baby prince named John Sigismund was growing up. The people were still fighting about religion. Different people followed different religions in Transylvania, and none of them got along. The Catholics were arguing with the Lutherans, the Lutherans arguing with the Greek Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox arguing with the Calvinists, the Calvinists arguing with the Catholics. It just went on and on. When John was 19, his mother Isabella died. Now he had to rule by himself at 19 years old. He wanted to be a good and wise king and to help the people, just like his mother had tried to do, but the people were still arguing about religion. His advisors told him that he should choose only one religion for everyone to follow in Transylvania. That would stop the fighting. But King John didn't think that would work. He decided that talking would be better than arguing. So John invited preachers from the different religions to come to his court and talk about religion. And they came. The preachers talked and talked and talked. Sometimes John feared they would start fighting again, but they didn't. One man talked especially well and he convinced people in every discussion he had. That man was Francis David. Nowadays, we call Francis David's religion Unitarianism, which is one of the historical roots of Unitarian Universalism, because he said that God was one pure being instead of being split into three, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. He said God was a unity, not a trinity. King John decided that he liked that religion too, and he became Unitarian. The advisors now thought that finally they had one religion for the country. But King John Sigismund had other ideas. He believed that having the freedom to follow whatever religion spoke to your heart and was most important to you was right. So at a meeting in the town of Torda, he issued a special law called the Edict of Torda. The law said that no one shall be treated badly for their religion by anyone. And he allowed the people of Transylvania the freedom to choose whatever religion they thought was best for them. This idea is still very important to use today. It's part of who we are. We accept the choice of each person to decide in their hearts which, if any, religion calls to them to follow it. May it always be so with us. I tell you how much I've missed that tune. Just to be able to sing softly together. I'm hearing it in the mask, it's okay. And to sing out and bless our children as they go on to their classes. It is such a gift. 
In this time, we have a chance to offer a little gift to each other. This is the time in our service where we light a candle. And that can be, we light these candles, candles in silence during our music for meditation. It is an opportunity to do a physical act, if you will, something that recognizes what is in the fullness of our lives and makes a little bit of that fullness visible in this beloved community. I want to invite you during our music for a meditation to come forward from one of the sides of the congregation and light the candles that we have before us. If we need more candles, we have more. Just let me know. We will take care of it. We have plenty of light to share. And now, let us enter into our music for meditation. From the Reverend Joan Jave Duval. You are beloved and welcomed here. Whether tears have fallen from your eyes this past week or gleeful laughter has spilt out of your mouth, you are beloved and welcomed here. Whether you're feeling brave or brokenhearted, defiant or defeated, fearsome or fearful, you are beloved and welcomed here. Whether you have untold stories buried deep inside or stories that have been forced beyond the edges of discomfort, you, you are beloved and welcomed here. Whether you have made promises, broken promises, or renewing promises, whatever is in your heart, however it is with your soul in this moment, in this space of welcome and acceptance, of commitment and recommitment, of covenant and connection, you, you are welcome here. This is the time for the sharing of joys and sorrows in our congregation. And we start with sending good wishes to Barbara Litchfield as she settles into new surroundings. Uh, we think Barbara might like to receive uh, cheerful cards. Um, you can send them to her in care of her daughter, Michelle. The Friday email has the address or contact the office or the caring team. Thank you for all your expressions of care and support as so many people make different moves in this time. And also we have a note from Mary Mahalan Kafar. Uh, 
she makes a note of joy for the amazing blessings bestowed on her lately, but most of all for a granddaughter reaching out and wanting to get to know her. That is a gift. Yay, Mary, and yay, granddaughter, too. I want to offer in our larger world, in our larger world, we offer a note of concern for Ukraine. The teacher and author, Clarissa Pinkola Estes, shared a, a message with the larger world about this. I want to offer a little bit of it for right now. Dear brave souls, she says, she invites all of us. Please join me at your ofrenda, altar, shrine, tree, sky, water, to pray for the people of Ukraine and all of the other parts of our world where powers bring weaponry of many kinds to try to intimidate the people, putting all in the way of a fire that does not warm, does not cook, does not light the dark. Pray there will be no misuse of fire as in days when vulnerable tribal groups were invaded and crushed and enslaved. Let the millions of sunflowers of Ukraine that awaken every morning facing east and by evenfall have turned their beautiful faces west. May all souls, in order to follow the strongest fire we know, follow and take energy from this blessed sun who shines on us all. Not just this one or that one, but unto us all. Let us strive to be that too. Let us pray hard that many, many persons remember the following of this light and warmth, that this eternal sun, not war fire, is our truest and greatest and most ancient love and light. We pray all be safe, that all will be protected, that all be seen or be visible and be invisible as needed, that all have plans as needed, and that all know they are loved by many from the world over. Our hearts are with Ukraine. I want to close with a prayer from my colleague, the Reverend Karen Johnston. Spirit of life and love be with us today and always, not just the us who attends this service, but the us of the human communities, the us of all beings on this life-giving planet. Or is it too strange to ask the thing which must already be true, for you are. We are. Life that which generates, that which decays, that which gives and takes away and does it again and again and again. So perhaps my prayer should begin again. Spirit of life and of love, ground of all that is, may we settle into our connection with you. May we know you and take you as real for the lives we are conformed into require of us that we deny you, contort you, dismiss you, ignore you. The drumbeat of war is in the lands bringing fear, threatening violence. Conflict is among the people who would otherwise work in shared purpose. There is exhaustion, despair. There is deep loneliness, there is shame, there is betrayal, there continues to be misogyny that kills and maims. There continues to be law enforcement that treats black and brown communities with more harm. There are sorrows inescapable in this mortal life, some of which have been named. And it brings us to our knees. And there's also joy. Gosh darn it, there's joy. Damn it, there's joy. Ugh. There is companionship of furry and feathered creatures. There are sunsets. There are colors of which break open our hearts. And there is poetry. There is music. There is art. There are moments we are saved by each other. Moments large and small. Like when a small band of volunteers and 
families show up for games and cookies on a Saturday. That was yesterday. Those people who show up and sing in the choir before service, that was this morning. And then prepare, those who prepare to welcome all who enter. Thank you to our ushers and our greeters. Truly, there are moments when we know we are home. There are moments fleeting as though they are when we catch the smallest glimpse of the holy. I invite us to spend a few moments together in shared quiet in the stillness, savoring all that is our life. Join me in a moment of quiet, and breath. Amen. We have for our reading today a section from the work of, of philosopher Karl Popper. And I want to thank Joe Lakota for joining me for the reading. Joe, if you come here. So, be here, I'll be over here. This is from Karl Popper, The Open Society and Its Enemies. The so-called paradox of freedom is the argument that freedom, in the sense of absence of any constraining control, must lead to very great restraint, since it makes the bully free to enslave the meek. Less well known is the paradox of tolerance. Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed, and tolerance with them. In this formulation, I do not imply, for instance, that we should always suppress the utterance of intolerant philosophies. As long as we can counter them by rational argument, and keep them in check by public opinion, suppression would certainly be unwise. But we should claim to right to suppress them, if necessary, even by force, for it may easily turn out that they are not prepared to meet us on the level of rational argument, but begin by denouncing all argument. They may forbid their followers to listen to rational argument because it is deceptive, and teach them to answer arguments by the use of fists or pistols. We should therefore claim, in the name of tolerance, the right not to tolerate the intolerant. We should claim that any movement preaching intolerance places itself outside the law. And we should consider incitement to intolerance and persecution as criminal, in the same way that we would consider incitement to murder, or to kidnap, or to the revival of the slave trade, as criminal. And now please join me, rise and body your spirit for our hymn by Leah Morris, listening. I'm listening, I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening, I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. 
My ears are wide open. My eyes are now open to see what I may be. I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening. I am listening. In this moment, of Spirit silence. speaks to me. I can hear the voices of all my kind. I'm listening. Singing. I'm listening. The tweeting. How singing to who? My ears are wide open, oh, oh, the joy. eyes are wide open, oh, 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 the love to see to hear for you be. and me. Oh, 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 I'm listening in this moment of silence. I am listening. I hear spirit speak through. Did you sleep well? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a favor? Can you go and cush with you for five minutes while I finish? You see, I'm doing some worky stuff. Please be seated. Within the theme of widening the circle for this month, I, I think it's important to enter into one of those most important values in Unitarian Universalism, that of tolerance. And the question that often comes with it is, what are the limits of tolerance? One of the ways I love kind of encapsulating Unitarian Universalism uh, borrows from Stan Lee, which is, we have great freedom paired with great responsibility and great accountability. And how do we navigate the perpetual dance between freedom and obligation, freedom and the limits that we need to set around each other and within each other and within ourselves that we may continue to pursue that freedom? I'll say more than once, one of the most common experiences in, in, a, in a progressive preacher uh, world is you know, once we start to kind of say there are limits, there are, are boundaries to this idea um, of what we're talking about, even as we draw in Unitarian Universalism from a multitude of sources, we love our deep and rich history, we love nature, we love science, we love poetry and music and so much more, and we draw from so many places. And, and there are limits. There are boundaries that we kind of articulate and re-articulate in our life together. So one of the most common uh, experiences for a Unitarian Universalist minister is to say, well, how can you preach this expansive message of, of tolerance and freedom and still say no? And I will be the first to offer that no is a complete sentence, hallelujah. So we have to talk about, I think I want to talk about tolerance and talk about some of those boundaries in this moment. Because Karl Popper affirms quite emphatically that there are lines. That you can have a wide range of tolerance. We want a, an open society, if you will. And that openness must be cherished and protected from those who would be intolerant, from those who would sacrifice the toleration for other agendas. You want to avoid, as he said, you want to, of course, avoid force of any kind if there can be rational conversation. 
I so appreciate Karl Popper and the, like, the 20th century thinkers and theologians who were like, right, people are rational, people are rational, and we're in the last five years, you're like, ooh, really? I have questions. <laughs> this rational thing is a little more tricky than maybe they are preaching. Because we have, because, you know, Popper wasn't dealing with the internet and social media and, and how, how misinformation, intentional misinformation can swing around the world in seconds and then is so hard to counter and dial back because it, it, it triggers our amygdalas. We've been having a highly anxious world experience for the last couple of years in particular. And, and our little anxiety buttons are on full throttle. And so in this moment, as a global experience, it's even more difficult to navigate the yes and the no. And to say, to those who would say that, that you must submit to my version of the world or you don't matter. I mean, that's what it ends up happening with more, some of the more conservative voices, some of the more fascist and controlling voices that say, if the world must be made in my image and anything else, I'm going to destroy it. Anything else is not worthy. The forces of tolerance would instruct, would the forces of intolerance would destroy tolerance if allowed to do so. The social contract that so many have presumed in so many ways has already been broken for quite some time. Ask those who are black, indigenous, and people of color, but it's even more so. And so we have this opportunity, this space, to reconfigure and remember what is it that we hold dear and why and then how to protect that. There are such profound differences in moral values. It's no wonder, I don't know about you, but I, I want to be with the people I want to be with that I agree with. I mean, you know, to be in if you're talking about like circles of tolerance, if you will, the circle of tolerance that says, you know, I, I want to be with people that are, are like-minded because it's so exhausting otherwise. But then to be enclosed with the people who you think are equally tolerant becomes its own resonance chamber and its own limitedness. So as I was reading Popper and thinking about this, I want to first begin with an understanding and reflecting on what does it mean? What does he mean by tolerance? Because we need so much space for it and so much reflection on it. So this was one of those interesting adventures in going into, into the dictionary because that's also scripture for the Unitarian Universalists. To go into thinking about tolerance. And, you know, one of the first definitions is that of endurance. Okay, I'm going to hang on until it's done. I can get through, you know, that kind of, all right, I don't like it, but I can be here. I can be in the present moment. So they're just kind of getting through something. But then there's that definition of tolerance that's um, allowances. You know, the engineers know about this, right? You know, as my father was uh, an engineer designing... Um, he was a flow kind of engineer. He helped make things flow, like steel through rolling mills and that kind of thing. You had to have very, very exact measurements to make steel flow. And so those allowances were teeny tiny, for example. So that kind, or the other places, there can be more wiggle if you need something a little less precise. So tolerance is allowance as well. But for Unitarian Universalists, we look at religious tolerance. And we look at how do we make the most space that we can for the wide range of beliefs and perspectives that we know is among us. And we also know that we all benefit from the freedom of search for meaning, the free and responsible search for meaning. We know 
how much that matters. Because in that, in that we get to engage and wonder together, ask our big questions together, maybe come up even with a few answers because we know we don't have them all by ourselves. So we need the breadth that is among us, and we need the breadth of religious and ethic, eth ethics and moral diversity that is in our world around us and in history and more. And I want to offer one of the questions that comes up in Unitarian Universalism is, um, we've done such a good job, for example, with creating safe spaces for those who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, and more. You know, we've been one of those leading faith communities that have created such safe spaces for people to come in and explore and figure out who they are. And if they could be public no place else but in a church like this, they can be, even if they have to be in the closet for the rest of their lives. That is no small thing. And so we talked about that early on. We talked about that language of that, that spaciousness as tolerance. And, and somewhere along the lines, that tolerance got, got a bad rap, if you will. It got shifted into, well, don't just merely, you know, mere tolerance. You're going to put up with me, but you're not really accepting me. I really want acceptance. We must, we must have acceptance and lessen the value, you know, kind of put aside the value of tolerance. You know, I saw this as a Unitarian Universalist kind of growing up. It's been this interesting conversation between acceptance and tolerance and saying we want tolerance, not just acceptance. I hear you. But I want to offer that tolerance in our context, it's it's not simply looking at the question of acceptance, but the opposite of tolerance is intolerance, is that there is no room for something different. So if you think of it as a, as a continuum, you have acceptance on one side, you have tolerance as a big space in the middle, you have intolerance over on another side. And so how do we work out this space, this circle of tolerance? And, and I want to offer, um, you know, I want to offer an example, kind of what, you know, what does like a personal range of tolerance look like and how do you kind of play with that? So I'll begin with um, a confession. I don't like olives. It, I don't. I don't understand them. I don't understand olives. I'm learning to appreciate olive oil with a strong flavor. I'm open to the idea that one can acclimate to foods when blended with others. For example, hide something in uh, a really good soup. I can deal with it. You know, if you don't even know what you're eating, you don't know that you don't like it. Great. But, honestly, I tested this a little bit of black olive ended up in my deli sandwich some time ago. I mean, I even saw it fall into the sandwich when the server was making it, and I didn't say anything. I'm like, you know what? Let me see what happens. Tolerance, right? I'm working on it. I had the sandwich. I enjoyed it. I got to the bite where that olive was. I swear, I thought something had died. I was like, oh! I really don't like them. There's a line. <laughs> it's okay to have a line. I tried it, and there's a line. Okay, no olives. When we get back to the promised land of like potlucks and so on and so forth, and it is a promised land, I'm looking forward to it. Just humor me when I don't go for the olives. Thank you. Tolerate the minister's intolerance, if you will. But in the very serious work, in the larger work of navigating tolerance and intolerance, we have to deal with all aspects of our life, the physical, the mental, our range of opinions, and, and to be around people, 
to be around the discomfort of being around people with genuine differences. And, and that's part of congregational life as well. And I so appreciate, you know, Jan Hus and Francis David being able to hold the line and say, you know what, we see how the society is being torn apart and we're going to live with a lot of discomfort because we're going to allow a little bit more spaces, spaciousness in this society so that there's a lot less violence against each other. We're going to allow more room for people to be. It's that managing of self. It's that emotional intelligence of managing of self and understanding where your space is and where somebody else's space is and being able to recognize that and respect it and to allow, if you will, that circle of tolerance to be as wide as possible, to be you know, permeable like a cell membrane, if you will, things that kind of, there's room to move and learn and explore and change your mind and try something new. You know, Earl Morris Wilbur is our source in Unitarian Universalism for the idea of tolerance, for really naming that as our value. And he talked about this, so this is one of those Unitarian Universalist um, history resources that many of us in ministry still had to... Um, had to read. It's like, it's old. I mean, it's like old. It's like he was, you know, this is, a, he was in the early half of the 20th century, and still this was our major text, you know, for me in, in the late 1990s. Um, but it, it's expressed a core of our history that's so important, where he talks about the value of the three elements of liberal religion and where we come from. He says, first, uh, there's three leading principles. First, complete mental freedom in religion rather than bondage to creeds or confessions. So complete mental freedom. Second was the unrestricted use of reason in religion rather than reliance on external authority or past tradition. You must have reason applied to religion. And third, third for this moment, generous tolerance of differing religious views and usages rather than insistence upon uniformity in doctrine and polity and worship. Generous tolerance, he said, of different religious views. So freedom, reason, tolerance. That's at the core of our liberal faith in the Unitarian tradition and the Christian tradition of which we come from. And he spoke about why this was important, why it was so deeply important to engage in intolerance in particular, but all three of these elements working together. He said, in 1920, he said, when all three are in place, they leave the soul of man face to face with God. This is 1920s language here, but there was something about that when I read it. They leave the soul of man face to face with God. He was talking about that when you have this freedom and reason and tolerance in combination, that you access, you have access to the individual experience of the holy. You rely upon mutual tolerance, religious tolerance of thought and practice of tolerance for different opinions, equality of regard for individual reason, for the experience of faith, and the freedom of thought, and the exercise of reason, those will bring you to direct encounter with all that is, with existence itself. That there should be nothing between the self and the holy, the I and the thou, and Wilbur goes on to say that this freedom in religious thought, it's not for an end itself. It's not, I got, you know, it's not a God goal, if you will. But rather, that what comes from that relationship then has direct application and meaning in how we engage in our mortal lives, how we engage in our world, how we relate to each other, how we serve. Because certainly, 
Wilbur would have been operating from the book of Micah, the, to do justly. You know, what, are you, what is required of you? What is required of you? To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. And he didn't just mean it for like the Unitarians, like all, got all the God revelation. He meant it for everybody. That we should have this space to grow in relationship to ourselves, the people around us, the earth, all that is. And it's not letting everything go. It is great freedom with responsibility. It is, as James Luther Adams reminds us, that we must have wide open minds, but not have minds open at both ends. Revelation comes right in and it goes right out the door. No. You want to hold on to that relationship and take something in and do something with it in this world. But how do we apply that from a practical perspective? What does it actually mean in our lives to kind of navigate this circle of tolerance? And how does it relate to intolerance? I was thinking about my ministry in Midland, Texas, for this one, because that was very much an, ex an exercise in acceptance and tolerance and intolerance. So while I was in Texas, um, there were five years when we, we lived north of Dallas, and then I commuted to West Texas, about 360 miles one way. Yes. <laughs> Patrick's like, yeah, my spouse. Patrick's like, eh, yeah, that was long. That was long. Whew, goodness gracious. And the wonderful congregation, they would, people would like have me stay with them so I could like be there for 10 days and then go back. I mean, it was a lot. Simply living in Midland is a network of circles of tolerance. Because Midland, Odessa, out there, that's oil country. The reason there are people there is because of oil. The reason that there's a population of any size is because of air conditioning. I mean, truly. So here is this community that directly trades in and consumes fossil fuels to exist and to keep making money because that's why they're there, because it makes a lot of money. That's why it's there. And there are generations of families there's a diversity of languages, of race, of culture. There is art and theater and beauty. There's high school football. You haven't seen high school football. I know what I'm saying. There's higher education. There's all the supporting elements of life that go along with people working and living. There's families, there's schools, there's parks, and there's a lot of great Tex-Mex food. I avoided the olives there too. Moderate and liberal and progressive voices have a lot to navigate in that environment. It was a daily task to serve with this congregation where most folks are involved with the oil industry and rely on that work for their income, love their work, while being in a faith that rails against um, harm to the environment, the extraction of fossil fuels, and wants to call our attention to climate change. Church message, work life, oh my goodness. Uh, marking also the problems of capitalism and consumerism and hyper-individualism and making that all more known. It was this spiritual struggle for those who find the oil, wanting to feel welcome and feel their church and their community in a congregation where people often spoke out against harm to the earth and harm to the environment. Ah, oh, the frustration. And I got to be the minister, and I got to be the minister for a short while and be a witness to navigating this and trying to foster community and grow a congregation in the midst of this. But the members really had to live with each other in a whole different way than I did. And, and those different edges of acceptance and tolerance and intolerance were all bumping into each other all the time. And here we are still, we're committed to freedom, reason, tolerance, love, justice in the world. 
and the worth of being a beloved community, raising children, supporting each other in hardship and illness and age, protecting each other's right for the search for truth and meaning, and recognizing there were moments when they were at an impasse because of conflicting priorities and yet still remaining connected. And what was also true was that you had folks who would leave the, the, the enclosure, the, the, the care of the congregation, and go into their work lives where they may not be able to say where they go to church and may have to endure hearing a lot of views that are deeply morally hurtful and in the spaces, in spaces that often did not tolerate variations in politics and perspectives. They would even navigate this circle of tolerance and then often encounter a much less tolerant world. The values, the value of what we strive for with freedom and reason and tolerance, it is, as Wilbur says, clearing the deck, making enough room for the great work it wasn't exclusive to Unitarians. He, he wasn't trying to be exclusive to the Unitarians even. He was like, if we, do, if we have done nothing else but clear the deck for the great work of humanity, that we may live together, advocate for each other's freedom, and put our humility and awe into practice, that we advocate for lives profoundly, deeply affected, in biased and harmful systems. That, that is what we're striving for in this great work of tolerance and why we must be as wide as possible and as protective as possible. He would talk about the teachings, you know, his, he came from directly the Christian line, the teachings of Jesus, who would have us tend to those who suffer, call out those who abuse power, and call out those who would interfere with other people's access to their God. It's not letting just, the, the work of tolerance is not just letting everything go. It's not all acceptance. It's not any one thing. It is keeping our minds and hearts open to the possibilities, but not entirely open that we lose ourselves and lose our space to be ourselves. Not let that world of tolerance be destroyed by intolerance. And as I'm close, I recognize that we leave from this space in this moment. This is, in fact, one of those circles. It's nice to be here. It's good to be here for a minute. And then we go out into the world and try to keep with us the meaning of that tolerance, not acceptance, not intolerance, to live in this world with its abundance of efforts of those who would conform, who would make the world over to their moral values, who would harm those who are marginalized, would harm all of us and would condemn and dismiss people if we don't agree. Let us go forth. It is up to us to navigate these questions in this future, in this day, and in this hour. Let us go forth. How we answer the question of tolerance and its paradox is up to us. How will you answer? Amen. Please join me for our closing hymn, Wake Now My Senses, from the late Thomas Michelson. Please rise in body or spirit. Receiving as love shows us how. Wake 
Take now my reason, reach out to the new. Join with each pilgrim whose quest for the true. Honor the beauty and wisdom of time. Suffer thy image and praise the sublime. Quick now compassion, give heed to the cry. Voices of suffering fill the white sky. Take as your neighbor both stranger and friend, praying and striving their hardship to end. Wig now my conscience with justice thy guide, join with all people whose rights are denied. Take not for granted a privileged place. God's love embraces the whole human race. Wake now my vision of ministry clear. Brighten my pathway with radiance here. Mingle my calling with all who will share. Work toward a planet transformed by our care. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. With what benediction shall I leave you? In your life, may you know the holy meaning, the mystery that breaks into it in every moment. May you live at peace in your world and at peace in yourself. And may the love of truth guide you in every day. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Mm.